Hello and welcome. It's time for more job lore and today it's White Mage, the first healer, for a while the only healer, and to be honest, my least favourite healer. But that's not for any reasons of its lore, which goes in a few fun and unusual directions across its story, weapons, history and techniques. Spoiler warning, we're going to go through all of White Mage's story, as well as touching on tiny bits from Endwalker that I try to avoid spoilers about. Other than that, I think we're mostly good to get rolling. If you like this, do YouTube things with likes, comments, and subscribes. And with that, let's get to it. Debuting in Final Fantasy 1, the White Mage started out as the main healer. Not much in the way of physical stats or defense, a whole bunch of access to healing spells and stats to make them good. They started simple. They also ended simple, because despite appearing in almost every single Final Fantasy, every version of White Mage is basically the same. You kind of don't want to mess with the formula of the healer too much when you've only got one, because if you make a team-based RPG where the healer is bad, your game might not be, you know, winnable. The most gameplay spin the series ever put on White Mage was by occasionally combining it with another job on a character. Four's Rosa has some Archer, and both Nine and Ten made their starring ladies White Mage Summoner combos. And while by no means influential on much of anything, I want to shout out to my personal favourite white mage, Minwoo from 2. I like this Middle Eastern vibe. As for the in-universe history, we've hit our first job in this series, not from the 6th Astral Era, as white mage dates back to the 5th Astral Era, developed by Amdapur. White magic and black magic were both devised in near parallel, although some sources such as Raya Osenna suggest white magic was the counter to black, and therefore it must have come at least slightly later. This discovery apparently led to ambition and greed though, and the subsequent arms race between Mark and Amdapur led to the War of the Magi and subsequent Sixth Umbral Calamity. Both nations were lost, Amdapur being deliberately hidden for a time by the Elementals, but their survivors made their way through, with Amdapurs in particular becoming the people of Gelmora, which I've already talked about a couple times. It's unclear if Gelmora used any white magic themselves at any point, but what we do know is that when members of Gelmora eventually made peace with the Elementals, leading to both the founding of Gridania and the birth of the Pajali as the Elementals' chosen representatives, they allowed these Pajali, and only them, to wield the forbidden magic of Amdapur. Pajali are white mages, and white mages are Pajali. Well, until we turn up as an exception, we'll get to that. One other thing to bring up that we know though, a lot of the naming schemes around the Pajali and Gelmora are based on the language of the Ainu tribe of indigenous Japanese. That's a struggle of a language to wrap my tongue around, there's very few native speakers still alive, but it does back up the overall angle that the relationship between the Pajali and elementals are meant to be akin to traditional Japanese faiths and the kami. It's time to hit up the Encyclopedia Eorzea for various pieces of lore on the equipment and techniques of white mages. As usual, while they go into the story of a lot of weapons white mage wields, we're only going to talk about the ones explicitly tied to white mage. Pretty much every single thing about the white mage garb falls back to Amdapur. This includes their iconic colour scheme. White symbolises purity, while the red is meant to be blood-coloured and symbolising life. Amdapur took this so seriously that only completely trained and recognised white mages were allowed to wear the combo, and even modern Pajali mostly stick to it. While the encyclopedia explains it using the Seventh Heaven set, it notes that this set is an exception in a few ways. While the Seventh Heaven robe retains its iconic length, most white mage robes are usually fairly plain and unadorned, as well as having no real gender distinctions. While they mostly wore hoods with their robes, circlets and other hair ornaments weren't unheard of. The boots were purely practical, being sturdy and form-fitting, suited for running around the battlefield. Much more typical white mage attire would be the healers set from a realm reborn, these days used exclusively for the Rite of the Quieting. Heavensward's Orison attire was also likely quite standard, 
although only worn by high-ranking Amdapori mages. The way this robe was made is completely lost though, as are most of the original examples. The only remaining real deal turned up in an old Arn antique store taken from a stone coffin of unclear origin. But, you know, probably Amdapor. As for the weapons, we start with Thyrus. Probably the most individually iconic of a Realm Reborn's relic weapons, it was wielded by generations of members of House Kant, before being thought lost in the final journey of a Tower Kant. It's actually also a go-to weapon representing Final Fantasy XIV in crossovers, often because Yishtola appears as the XIV rep, so she brings white mage weapons. Heavensward artifact weapon the Seraph Cane was an unearthed relic of Amdapur, with its head being adorned with the carving of a heavenly guardian of mortals that's fairly commonly seen in the city statues. It's probably not a Sin Eater, but I can't make any promises. Archaeologists think it was used by particularly high-ranking white mages, but there's no definite proof of it. Beyond those two, it's actually pretty rare to see canes of specific white mage origins. The only one of note is probably Amor, the Stormblood artifact weapon. It was guarded by the Conjurer's Guild, and its crystals are a naturally occurring phenomenon rather than an adornment, but there's no mention of any notable owners or abilities. There's also the Whispering Rod wielded by Arun Senna, but it probably isn't white magey beyond that wielder. Apparently, repeated enchantments gave its sentience akin to a familiar, although I can't do much with it but move its head. That's not more impressive than Monk's murder pants, so that still keeps the throne, but it is more existentially terrifying. What the hell, eh, Rune? Beyond that, nothing else, but it is interesting that a couple of the other white mage canes of note are noted to be of religious importance to other cultures, especially in the Far East. Now, the abilities. Almost all of these are pretty brief though, sorry to say. Benediction gathers ambient ether from around the area to heal the recipient of all wounds. Holy was actually devised back in the days of Amdapur, and is purify magic jacked up to a lethal level. It was deployed so often that their lights became a distinctive sight of the War of the Magi, and knowing white mages, I can believe it. Asylum is also cast using ambient ether to create a dome of restorative power and was apparently devised by Atawa Kant on his journeys across the land. And the limit break, Pulse of Life. This draws on the ethereal reserves of every single ally to channel pure life force from the caster and into everyone present. Let's quickly ask, does that sound like emotional amplification by Dynamis? I'm landing on... eh, maybe. Nothing there sounds Dynamis-y, but unlike some other descriptions, it's also not pinning the power on anything else too specific. Hitting up the job quests? White Mage has a fun exception. It's the only job that was present in 1.0 that actually had a different storyline back then. Yeah, every other job, scripts damn near exactly the same, but White Mages changed significantly, because it was actually about communing with one of the elementals. And not just any elemental, but one named Oha Sok, an elemental with an apparent nihilistic outlook who seems to remember causing the sixth Umbral Calamity, although is characteristically a little too grandiose, indirect, and poetic about discussing it for us to get many clear details. Now, this storyline probably got changed because the Realm Reborn massively changed how the story approaches the elementals. They're not really a thing you talk to anymore, so that story can't work. But if you've ever heard the assertion that the elementals caused the sixth calamity, and I know even I've repeated that here, it's come from exactly this questline and nowhere else. Everywhere else is actually ambiguous about this. So, that immediately raises a pretty burning question. Is it canon? And the answer to that is unclear. I've even talked to a couple other lore knowers, and we can't be certain. Anonymous and Croatoan lean towards no, because it doesn't completely jive with how the game writes the elementals and that Ohasok wasn't 
really a super reliable narrator anyway. Meanwhile, Soonzy feels like it's still possibly in play. The game and related sources have put forward multiple theories about the Sixth Calamity, but none of them really contradict, so it's possible that they're all somewhat true, including Ohasok's messy semi-admission. Me personally, I'm leaning towards it's a plausible conclusion until we're told something clearer. It certainly sounds legit, and tracks especially with how the Pajali have behaved in the time since, but we also shouldn't necessarily get mad and call it a retcon if it turns out that it actually was caused by something else. But what about the current, definitely canon white mage quests? Well, they start with Isumi Yan directing us to provide some backup to the two non-elder seed seers, Raya Osena and Arun Sena, who are out to perform the quieting, the ritual that calms and placates the most powerful of the elementals. Isumi Yan's asking us basically out of being a worry wart, but it turns out he was right too. Not only are the younger Senna siblings just garbage at fighting, but the quieting can only be performed by three Pejali, or more correctly, three white mages, and while those two terms have been synonyms for centuries, there's suddenly an exception as the Guardian Tree gives the Warrior of Light the soul crystal of the legendary white mage, A Tower Kant, who resolved to wander the lands helping those in need, rather than cloister himself in the shroud just in case the elementals acted up. Suddenly, it's rather possible to perform the quieting without the terminally busy canny Senna, but we need to practice that white magic first, as well as to properly enchant the required healer's robes, and prove to the skeptical Arun that we're not a total schmuck. We finally get all that together, although the trio can't quite swing the quieting without some extra help from the still lingering spirit of A Tower Kant himself, borrowing some of our own power to manifest physically. Soon after though, he's right back to his eternal rest. This actually covers a couple important things. First of all, this is the first time in these videos where the outfit is genuinely important rather than just a status symbol we earn, which is neat. It also confirms that White Mage as a job is basically conjury with an extra layer, and is the first time we see a spirit not completely passing into the ethereal sea just yet. But most interestingly, the story underlines that White Mage is one of the rarest jobs in the entire game. Not only are they not actively recruiting in the ways that previous jobs we've discussed have been, but it's explicitly stated that White Magic is only used by the Pajali, with the Warrior of Light being the sole exception. Going strictly by lore, that means that there's only about five White Mages in the entire world. However, I will grant that it's entirely possible Amdapur's ruins hold some of their crystals. We know there was a good amount of them back in the day. Heaven's Ward finds us responding to the Elementals freaking out again, this time about a threat outside of the Twelves Wood. To do this, we team up with the descendant of an apprentice of Eitawa Kant, a woman named Eschiva, who's immediately pretty pissed that the Pajali refused to leave the Shroud to help, leaving her and the Warrior of Light to handle it themselves. After successfully tracing it to a tainted water vein, they find the source to be Alaka, a necromancer of some sort who aims to strike back against the people of Ishgard that mistreated and killed her tribe mates. This is something that comes up more than once around the game, but apparently there was an unnamed tribe of Zayla, at least unnamed as far as I can tell, that tried to migrate to Eorzea, only to get mistaken for being draconic by Ishgard, who hunted down and killed them. Alaka aims to spread tainted ether so that an undead dragon she's risen can plague everywhere that taint spreads. But we actually beat it, with the Pajali's help, they eventually leave the Shroud to offer it, by literally just healing the dragon's messed up ether. I've seen people ask where the classic Final Fantasy use healing magic to hurt the undead mechanic is in this game, and we can answer that, it's here. During the whole venture, Eschiva notes that we seem to get stronger after healing the taint, which suggests that the Pajali's insistence on not leaving the shroud 
might actually be a self-defeating shackle on them. They'd be stronger and more capable of tending to the elementals if they tried going outside once in a while. Also, Alark has later learned to be training with the Conjurers, so if you're someone who worries about her old enemies, she does okay. Stormblood finds us responding to the elementals freaking out, again, this time about a threat outside the Twelveswood, again. It turns out this one's just over the border in Alamigo, and when investigating it, we actually get help from, of all people, Selfie, the famous honest healer from the Conjury quests. Yeah, if you haven't picked it up yet, a lot of Stormblood's job quests had a thing of bringing back class quest NPCs. Selfie ends up a surprisingly useful person to have though, because the disturbance turns out to be a kid named Gabby awakening to being a Pajali. The Pajali we've met up until now were all very emotionally restrained, and it turns out that's because if they aren't, their ether goes buck wild, and Gabby's is attracting void scent. Gabby's mother is suffering from an illness, which prevents her being able to easily travel to Gridania for proper training. While Isumi Yan agrees once he finds out that it's best for Gabby to live with her, and that state of affairs lasts for all of about six minutes before Gabby's mother dies, and literally all hell breaks loose. Fortunately, if there's one thing White Mage lore and gameplay both taught us, it's that liberal use of holy is the best way to handle Void Scent, and that's what we do. And of course, even when all this wraps, it's not the last time we hear about any of these, as White Mage has some roots that spread elsewhere. If you've leveled White Mage, then you can bring up the quieting in Endwalker's tank roll quest, and of course, Arun Senna is part of the Ilsevard contingent heading to Garlemald. So, there we have it. Everything there is to know about White Mage. It's kind of a weird one lore-wise, because technically there's very little about White Mage itself to bother about, but it ties so heavily into certain setting elements and brings up a bunch of neat stuff that you don't really consider. If you like this, encourage me with YouTube buttons. Still hoping to get community posts someday, hoping that'll start happening sometime. I'll leave you off with a quick overview of what we've learned we should do as White Mages. According to the series history, we should heal. According to the abilities, we should cast holy a lot. And according to the story, we should heal and cast holy. Well, I can't knock him for going off message. Thanks for joining me, and I hope to see you all again real soon.